Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. How safe is the manufacturing industry? Now, your instinctive response to that may be right, uh, but there's a good chance that perhaps you've got some perceptions about that industry uh, that might be wrong. And my guest today, uh, Chris Newsom, works for Make UK, which is a trade organisation in uh, very simple terms that supports the sector. So he and I have a really in-depth conversation about what the sector is doing well, uh, where it can improve, and crucially, what you can learn from manufacturing, even if you're not in the world of manufacturing, to help make your own uh, organisation or sector safer as well. As always, if you get value from this and you enjoy it, please hit follow, like, subscribe, whatever the right terminology is, wherever you are. Uh, give us a share on social media and, and tell your friends and connections in the safety world, uh, the more the merrier to join us on these episodes. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Chris Newson of Make UK and I about how to make manufacturing safer. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success Podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Thanks for joining me today, Chris. No problem, Christian. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. I'm really interested to have a chat to you about the sector that you're in. Um, and I'm hoping to do a number of similar interviews to this where we speak about sectors and try and kind of give people a flavour for what's going on in that sector. And hopefully they can, yeah. you know, learn something and draw uh, something from that to to help improve whatever it is that they're up to as well. So, uh, yeah, should be should be good. Yeah, um, I, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, I thought we'd start, Chris, by you mentioned before when we when we spoke uh, a sort of incident or a story that kind of got you very interested in uh, yeah. safety and safety culture in particular. I wonder if you might start by just telling us that. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, so it, it's uh, yeah, nicely said. It's an interesting story. I hope it is. Um, I've talked about it a couple of times. Uh, you know, events and things because it is the one incident, uh, and that's the right word that got me into to health and safety, uh, actually. So, and, and it's a real, um, it's manufacturing and it sort of really fits with what we're talking about. So basically, you know, the, the story is quite straightforward. Um, I'd just become a health and safety manager uh, for um, a, a large engineering firm. I've just done my NEBOSH certificate. Uh, so that was exciting. Remember those days, I'm sure. Um, and this was the first serious accident I'd had to investigate at work. Mm. So, so basically, uh, the, the, the story of the accident is there was two, two workers, uh, fitters. So their, their job for this company was putting uh, large assemblies together. Um, basically, you know, like most manufacturing businesses, tight timelines, uh, everything sort of rushed. Um, and just for context, I suppose this was about 20 years ago, something like that. Um, so these two guys, they're asked to do this job, fitting these things together at the weekend, uh, and it's got to be finished for Monday. So there was a, literally a lorry booked and it's taken this assembly out. And, you know, this is important to the story. The, the, the managing director, the most senior person in the company said to them, um, and, and, you know, these are the words that, that he said, meaning maybe is different, but the words that he said were, this has got to go out Monday morning no excuses that's got to happen so that was that was what the guys were, were were working towards um and uh so they start work they're the only people in the factory um uh, and it becomes apparent that the the parts that they need um aren't there so you know for whatever reason um so they try to ring the supervisor um and they're not available and didn't answer their phone, et cetera, et cetera. Usual, well, it's just usual, but, you know, a, a common story. So what do they do now? They're left with, they can't, they haven't got bits to build the thing that's got to go out on Monday. Um, they knew the spare parts were in the, or the available parts were in the storeroom behind them, which was like a sort of um, uh, just a panel. Uh, and one way, and it was locked, one way to get into that 
is to climb over the top. So um, shortcut the story. One of the one of the guys decided to climb about eight foot up uh, to get over into the compound, if you like, to get the part. And you can imagine what happened. Um, he gets to the top, loses his balance, falls off. Uh, and I won't be too graphic about the injury, but he landed on something um, which which injured him significantly. And mm -hmm. his 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 colleague, his mate, is then left. You know, what do I do? Uh, and panics and so on, as, as you know, most people would. I think so. Rings an ambulance eventually, <clears throat> and and the guy, the ambulance arrives. The guy's taken away. Um, and and just to finish that part of the story, he, he was very seriously injured. Um, he had uh, muscular injuries to his leg. Um, did return to work about six months later, but the real impact for him was he used to play sport physically golf and he you know he could still do that but it was now painful rather than a fun experience that it was mm. before so because of, of a decision that he's made that that's what's happened the interesting part for me uh, and what um the bit that impacted me the most was remember now i'm the health and safety manager here so if someone rings me and says okay this accident's happened at the weekend can you can you go into the factory and investigate so i turn up and i see the scene that i've just uh, explained and uh, the guy's been taken to hospital um and i collect all the information as you do you know root cause analysis and, uh, and so on as much as i as i could um the interesting thing is what happened next so the the uh, the md rings me you know uh, and, and asks me what's happening and rather than saying how's the person that you know that question was never asked um the question was are we going to get prosecuted you know that that was that was literally the question are we going to get prosecuted are we going to get into trouble uh etc and it was basically you know find out what's happened i'll see you in at uh, monday morning eight o'clock in my office and we'll go through it um so i investigated turned up there um and and then the supervisor arrived as well uh, and we're in this sort of uh, meeting the supervisor says, don't worry, I've just completed the risk assessment, uh, so we're not liable, we're not going to get into trouble. And I obviously said, okay, you've just completed the risk assessment. Uh, not quite as, uh, I'll probably put it in a slightly softer way, you know, the risk assessment perhaps should have been done before the activity. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what really got me, to, to get to the point, what really got me into health and safety there is the the sort of, the, the, the care the cultural aspect if you like yes you know the accidents happened mistakes have been made but if we can all see you don't need to be an experienced health and safety professional to see that the main driver you know to get that job done on time was the was the words given by the md at the beginning of the story you know that's what would have been on the person's mind i'm sure yeah. um and you know you ask him afterwards and he would have never made the same decision again and you know, we've all been there. We've got to make a decision and the pressure's on it and you make the wrong one. Yeah. Um, so that's it. it. It pointed me towards the fact that culture, behaviour, leadership are multiple times more important in health and safety than things like the law uh, or rules and regulations, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So then I got into health and safety properly. Yeah. It, it, it is a very interesting story and it's something I'm sure that people will relate to, you know, perhaps without the serious consequences, but that kind of difficulty of, of balancing, you know, yeah. production, profit, et cetera, with keeping people um, safe and well. And we'll we'll get into that a bit more <clears throat> um, as we talk about manufacturing. So obviously that is a sector uh, that is, you know, very driven by um, performance and, and process and, and, yeah, being you know, things being done on time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, before we before we start going into that, um, if people don't know what Make UK is, could you just explain kind of what it is as an organisation, and, and in particular, I suppose, um, yeah. what it does around health, safety, well being, and, and kind of your role within that? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so uh, you know, I'm bound to say this, but Make UK is is a very interesting organisation um, because we are we do many different things um, so we're not just a environment health and safety business that's the bit where i work and the bit that i manage but we actually are a, a much bigger organization at heart we're a membership uh, body membership organization um, and we have multiple thousand uh, member companies so it's a company membership not an individual 
Um, and to give you a, a brief flavour of everything we do, um, we have a, a department that sits in Westminster, a policy department that lobbies government. Um, our CEO, Stephen Phipson, is um, very active uh, with in talking to the government uh, about matters like, like EHS, but also uh, HR, legal, um, general policy, uh, economics, all of that sort of stuff. So we're connected with government at the very highest level. Um, and, and we in that in that um, window, we represent our members. So if our members, manufacturing businesses of the UK, think that a particular regulation, let's take CE marking, for example, is going to be particularly um, good or bad for them, or they have a particular view on it, they will tell us and we will represent that view uh, to government. So at one end of our business, of our organisation, that's what we do. So we steer um, national policy, sometimes international um so, so that's one end the yeah. bit that i work in is the ehs uh, department if you like or unit and and what we do is we have uh, we are a training organization we we do we deliver all the usual training which you would expect i won't list the accreditation bodies we all know who they are yeah uh, but we do all that sort of um, professional development training you know if you want to become a health and safety professional we can take you all the way from you know, the beginning to the end of that that journey uh, and, and support you along the way. So that's training. We also do consultancy. So we'll go along to our member organisations and we'll help them uh, with a particular problem or a particular project. Um, sometimes we are their responsible person in terms of health and safety. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk a bit more about culture in particular, uh, perhaps a, a bit later on. Yeah. Um, so that is, that's that's what we do um, in terms of, so training, uh, consultancy, um, but our aim is really to help UK manufacturing continue this journey of improvement in, in safety related and environmental yeah. related yeah. matters. So that, yeah. that's our sort of ethos. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I think it's useful to have that context um, yeah. for, 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 um, for, for the people joining us. So, um, you know, you shared that story and obviously that is... A very tragic thing that happened. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't worse. Obviously, for the for the yeah. poor chap. Um, but it was a good kind of microcosm of, I guess, scenarios that could happen uh, quite a lot. So, what does sort of safety as a um, profession or as a as a, a vocation need to do to kind of embed itself within the manufacturing sector, um, yeah. where we've got this kind of um, you know productivity versus safety or profit versus safety potential yeah. um sort of uh friction point shall we say um cool. and so you know what do we need to do and then kind of how would you advise somebody to you know if they're if they're if they are in the sector to sort of try and achieve that you know what do they need to do to go to their board and try and get their board engaged in this a bit more okay uh okay so that's uh obviously a huge question so there's there's many points to it so so yeah. we can discuss we but, can, we'll, we'll unpack it yeah 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 sounds good in terms of um let's start with with where manufacturing is so i i think it's, it's really interesting depending who you ask manufacturing is seen as a, a, a dangerous business and people that are in manufacturing might say that it probably isn't and so it's interesting to look at the statistics so i had a bit of a look you know b before our uh, before talking so mm. if you look at manufacturing, th these are obviously based on HSE statistics of, of the yeah. last financial year, which and I realise aren't the be all and end all of everything. It relies on people reporting stuff. I, I get it. Yeah. But that's what we've got. OK. Um, so if we look at ill health, uh, manufacturing as a, as a sector is somewhere down at the it's within the bottom third uh, of, mm -hmm. in terms of so quite a low number of ill health reported that i.e very serious cases so three thousand in every hundred thousand um ill health cases reported in manufacturing um so you know difficult to unpack that much more but that's you know you might say not too bad we're down at the bottom third uh yeah. top of that list are um, sectors like education and um social work and, and you can sort of imagine what those particular problems might be it then gets you know even more interesting because you look at injuries and in terms of injuries now we're halfway up the list we being okay. manufacturing yeah so yeah uh 1700 in every thousand 
uh, are reportable injuries, so relatively serious. And you've you've got the if I say the um, the companies that sorry the sectors that have been at the top for a very long time, agriculture and construction are still one and two. Yeah. yeah. But but manufacturing is is there, so it's about halfway. Unfortunately, you know those two things are you could see them as positive because we've come down the list, so that that's good. Unfortunately, it seems that when you look at the stats, when something goes wrong in manufacturing, it is very serious. So, yeah. you know, I'm not a fan of reeling out fatal injury statistics. OK, you know, we, we've all seen them, but it is but it is quite important for this point. So we probably all realise that there were you know, whether we know the number exactly. We've got a rough idea. There were 138 fatalities yeah. in the in UK workplaces um, in the last financial year not including roads and and some other uh, bits and pieces in that as we know um manufacturing is actually third in that list uh, mm -hmm. and you've got okay you've got agriculture you've got construction uh, at the top as always but manufacturing's third and so and and again the number's important so 16 out of those 138 fatalities were in manufacturing and mm -hmm. so whilst on one hand um uh, we're coming down the list of injuries and um, ill health conditions like I said just now when it when something goes wrong it is serious because inevitably in most manufacturing businesses you've got a relatively high risk so so that that's that's the sort of overview of where we are uh, you mm. know to answer that first bit of the question um, I guess it's difficult isn't it yeah. because obviously it's such a you know manufacturing spans such a huge breadth of activities you know yeah. from sure. uh, you know really heavy industry stuff through to sort of I guess um people make, making i don't know clay pots at home or something or yeah, else, yeah. You know, in, in, yeah, in, yeah in a shed somewhere so you kind of and you've got that full spectrum so yeah yeah absolutely yeah and and what the other sort of um this is just my opinion the other um sort of slice through this data you can take is is when you've got you know, smes and uh, small yeah. businesses and, and you've got big organizations and i, I think mm. if you sit back and think about it you would imagine I'm not saying this is the case, but you would imagine that big companies are, are quite safe and, and do everything they've got to. And, and SMEs, uh, you know, are, are less inclined to do that for, for lots of reasons. And, and actually, we are uh, we're in contact. Our membership is SMEs up to big global organisations. We cover everything. And actually, that's not true. I mean, we've got mm. some really good small companies and, and uh, the opposite maybe is true as well. So, mm. you know, that that's one slice you could take. But I think there's something interesting if you look at that. Um, the good news, and this is part of your question, the good news about manufacturing is that these statistics have come down, you know, over the last 20 years. I want, I'm not going to go back to the start of the Industrial Revolution. We all, we all <laughs> yeah, realise yeah. right, We all realise it's come down since then. Great. Yeah. yeah. But, but over the last 20 years, these numbers, you know, fatalities, injuries, etc., have come down mostly. Uh, ill health actually has, uh, has increased, but the others have come down. Um, so, so that's really positive, obviously. The point, though, is that over the last five years, those numbers have, have plateaued uh, mm -hmm. across all areas. Um, certainly, sorry, certainly injuries and, and fatalities. So there's this bit of a plateau. And and you mentioned something interesting before. You, you said, you know, process, manufacturing is, is a process-driven industry, which yeah, absolutely spot on, it, it is. And people, I feel like, or, or companies, let's say, are very good at having rules, very good at we've got a management system, we're accredited to 45,001, whatever it might be, and here's our folders with paper in that we've got risk assessments and safe systems work and, and we've done everything we need to. But the interesting thing, like my story at the beginning when we started talking, is is the behaviour behind that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. okay, we've got all the rules and everything, but but do people follow it? Um, and that's that's a very big question. Mm -hmm. I I think that if we talk about, I really don't like this word in health and safety, and the word is compliance, yeah. right? And and you probably imagine why, but but companies are driven by it's not just manufacturing; they're driven by compliance. Here's the law; we've got to meet the law. We, we know that in the UK, we've got a very active enforcement agency, both health and safety wise and environmental. So it's important that we we follow those rules. Um, and, and, you know, we don't want to change that off quite clearly. Mm -hmm. But I think now as, as we're getting down to this 138 people killed in, in the country in the last financial year, 
in order to make, and I said that's plateaued, in order to make a step change, we need to move beyond rules and actually look at behaviours and that sort of rather big subject of culture. Uh, and within that, I think it's important that the role that leadership has to play. So mm -hmm. if, if I can summarise and answer your question, you know, manufacturing has got a lot better over a long period of time. We've still got significant problems. It is a high risk industry. Um, and for me, it's more about, you know, it's that next level now. We're, we're very good at rules, mostly. We're very good at following them. But, but sorry, we're very good at implementing them. Mm. But how do we move past the, A, getting everyone to follow them, but B, actually moving even beyond that and, okay, follow the rules, but actually get involved in developing new rules and new process in, you know, improvement, new way of doing things. That's where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. That's a really good um, summary. Uh, I know from the um, sort of insurance claims data right. uh, that um, slips, for example, which is obviously my area, is is the biggest cause of, of claim. Uh, yeah. And yeah. what I find in slips is kind of analogous with what you've just said about the sector, which is that, you know, we have the the basics in place and we're doing the basics pretty well i guess and therefore like your data slips plateaus this has plateaued for, for years but there's yeah. still a large uh problem and it's as you say it's kind of going beyond that and just saying well look could we put in an extra five or ten percent of effort and resource and whatever but but would that therefore give us a, a an incrementally larger return um and that's the interesting challenge to grapple with isn't it yeah but how would you absolutely. sort of um advise yeah. you know your your members uh then and anybody um joining us on today to try and influence their business their organization to kind of yeah. take that next step Have you got any thoughts on that yeah definitely yeah so i think the um the the subject of of slips in particular um it's obviously your expert area not not mine but like you say we we, yeah. we come across <clears> it a lot as a particular area and you write obviously everything you say I think it's very interesting when you look at behaviours because I I feel like I haven't got any data to back this up. I think one of the big issues with slips is, you know, they happen, they're around. You know, we've put some sort of practical measures in to stop them, but they do happen. But yeah. in, in examples that I've seen, it's a lot of people seeing the thing, the, the spillage, the, you know, whatever it might be, and actually not doing anything about it. You know, because yeah. and, and why? Because they're too busy. Yeah, there's a list of excuses, or, or let's use a slightly less inflammatory word, reasons. <laughs> reasons um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, th there's, there's lots of things. So that's a really good example of culture. And for me, yeah. that uh, extends into the rest of manufacturing. So, mm. you know, I, I don't want to bore everyone that's listening here, but, but I think this is important. If, if you look at things like the Bradley curve, right, to really get into yeah. culture and... Um, it, it, I'm sure everyone is familiar with that, but if people aren't familiar with it, it, it looks at the culture of your organisation and it has four different levels that you fit into uh, and it describes how your organisation, let's say, does health and safety. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think in manufacturing, um, there's a lot of businesses still that are what the model calls dependent. So that means that they, they're driven by process they follow the rules, you know, here are the rules, you follow them, fantastic, you know. I, I realise there's lots of companies that that, that doesn't happen in, yeah, I get that, course. but, you know, a, a, a quite a lot in manufacturing, we follow the process, and now that process might be to do with manufacturing, it will have an element that says, you know, make sure the guard's closed, make sure yeah. the safety glasses are on, something like that, do simple examples. So I think a lot of manufacturing businesses are in that dependent area. If you look at the model the next level along is interdependent sorry independent so okay. you're you're thinking about other people and trying to um you know help them and, and you care about them genuinely in other words if i see um someone not wearing ppe i will do something about it in companies that are at that next level of, of cultural maturity yeah now that becomes even more of a challenge because I, and I'm talking about myself here, you know, I would feel uncomfortable going up to someone and saying, you know, you haven't got your safety glasses on or, or can you shut the guard or whatever it might be. And I do it as a job, more, more or less. My job's a bit, little bit more than that, but, uh, you know, something like that. Yeah. 
I know it's important is my point and, and I would still struggle to do it. So it's very difficult getting people to do that. But I think the companies that are successful in manufacturing are the companies where that is the culture. You know, we look after each other and so on. And the final bit of the model, um, you know, that sort of holy grail element here. Um, so, that, sorry, just to correct myself, the bit I talked about before uh, uh, was inter, interdependent. Independent. Yep. Now I'm talking about interdependent. So, yep. um, very similar words. Now, th this is where we, we're actually coming up with ideas and we're saying, you know, this is how we can improve. This is you know, it continues improvement, right? You know, it's it's not new uh, subjects. It's, I think it's been around for quite a while. And yeah. we do it in quality and we do it in other things. But we need to do that in health and safety, this continuous improvement bit. You know, I am going to look after myself. I am going to look after other people. But also I'm going to come up with ideas um, about how we can improve. Now, yeah. you know, the real answer here is this is a little bit of a generalisation possibly. But the reason why... In examples I've seen, the reason why people don't put their hand up and say, well, you know, I think we could improve this, I think we could do that, is there's two, really. It's not made easy for them, you know, mm -hmm. and that old thing about, okay, what's your near-miss system like? Is it a paper-based system that I've got to fill in an eight-page form? And they do exist, I've seen them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not an exaggeration, right? So, so is it an eight page form and actually no one does anything. Well, you don't have to be a psychologist to know no one's going to do that because it's crazy. Um, so is it process? Is it about the process that makes it hard for people to get involved and suggest things? Or is it actually the reaction they get from leadership? Mm. And, and you know, this isn't a real example, but just a, just a worst case scenario here. You know, if I put my hand up and say, this is unsafe, but but actually here's a way we can do it. And someone who I perceive as a, as a leader says, yeah, we're not going to do that. It's too expensive. And thanks very much and all that. Just get back and do your job. Right. You know, you've heard those conversations probably. Yeah. That person, that person will never suggest anything again unless they're extremely strong willed. Right. So they're probably not going to suggest anything again. And we've lost that opportunity. Uh, you know, the, the, there's it's very obvious, I think, that. Who are the people that know the most about the process, the most about the business, the activity in your company? Well, they're the people that do it. You know, they're, they're the people, right? You know, often I mean, we can describe workers. You know, we can describe it in various different ways. But the workers are the people that know what's going on. And, and, and really, you know, they do know the right and safe way to do things. And if we listen to them more as leaders, that would make a huge impact. But look, it... Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on people, and it's this old argument of, you know, I haven't got time to listen. I'm busy. I'm you know mm. doing X, Y, and Z. It's incredibly powerful. You think about all the money that you put in as an organisation to making sure people follow the rules and having a health and safety manager and legal compliance audits and so on, and and, and all those things are important. But if you were to invest more in, um, you know. What, what what your involvement can be as a leader, your presence, your the message that you're giving. We all say, don't we, that, that I think we all say health and safety is our number one priority. Yeah. Right. That that that's a nice thing to say, but that you know, I would privately ask myself the question if I was leading a, an, an organization, is it really? And mm -hmm. and if it is, if it is, then demonstrate that. You know, it doesn't need to be at the expense of everything else. You can right. be very productive and a health a healthy and a safe organization so sorry that's rather a long answer but but i think it is about behavior and and it's about leadership getting involved and, and leading by example mm -hmm. do, do you think that that sort of reaction that you identify there so somebody says i think we could do this safer and the senior person yeah. sort of poo poos the idea um, right do you think that that would also happen if they were speaking about some kind of technical process that would improve productivity or do you think that there might be a slightly different reaction to that kind yeah. of suggestion yeah well my, my good question my personal view answer to that is that there would be a, a very different reaction and and again once again it's interesting because if you say if someone says to me do this and you can save you know half a million pounds a year make it up i mean 
I, I asked her how much it costs to do it, probably, or, or work it out. Yeah. And I'm probably going to go, that's a brilliant idea. Fantastic. But if someone says to me, forget it's me, different person. Someone says, um, yeah. you know, do this, we can keep people safer. You know, it, it's it's a different, It's maybe it's a different argument. But mm. but but as you and I and probably everyone listening knows, if we start to have accidents, if we hurt people, it's probably going to cost us a lot more than it depends what what happens, right? But it's going to cost us a lot of money. You yeah. know, I, I don't want to go through the list, but there's everything right. from yeah, yeah, interesting yeah. fines to damage to reputation. So yeah, and and it, and it's what I I think you know to add to this, I think the really uh, top level. EHS or health and safety practitioners now have that skill, that ability to, to, to make the argument you've just said and make it convincing because mm. there's no doubt poor health and safety costs you a lot of money. Yeah. But, you know, I know that, you know that, everyone listening knows that, but, but it's not that evident perhaps at the top level. So it, it's important for health and safety practitioners these days, not to just know how to do a risk assessment, for example, um, and, and what the law says, but how do I put forward a good argument that will actually get investment? In? And it's not just about financial investment, as I was saying before, you know, how do I get leaders involved in the programme? Because mm. they are the ones that will make the difference. Yeah, yeah. I always think that it's important to try our best to link safety with performance in some way shape or form or productivity or, or something yeah. because i think that as you say you know uh, and, and i'm and i'm your reaction was what i expected you to say um yeah. it's easier to, to 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 convince somebody on that side of things so therefore i think you know we need to try to quantify prove that linkage as much as we possibly can to say well look an investment here in safety um it's not just about keeping people safe because we want to do that anyway but you know we i get that you know yeah. If you can do something to make half a million of profit or you can keep people safe, you're probably going to do uh, the former. Well, what can yeah. we actually, how can we tie keeping people safer with better morale, better retention of staff, higher productivity, fewer distractions, and therefore higher performing uh, team? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And, that, and that's the, that really is, is the holy grail. That is how we get over this. 138 fatalities every year yeah. that's plateaued for the last five years. I mean, that, yeah. that's how we get there. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, we've got great, I mean, not everyone might agree with this comment, but we've got good laws, we've got health and safety work that's been there for 50 years, not changing anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've got an enforcement body that takes things very seriously and does things, uh, but also does a lot to guide us and, and help. So, you know, everything else is there. To me, it's now about how, you know getting into that 138 and reducing it is about how do we really change behaviours and culture at a top yeah. level so that they yeah. can influence it it it, it uh, throughout the organisation. You know, mm. and mm. and it is it definitely is important that today's EHS practitioner can have that argument at that senior level. You know. Again, arguments probably not the right word. But can put that case across at a senior level. Yeah. That is, you, you know, as I'm sure you know, you find that on all current diploma syllabus uh, that there are. It is something that we we all know uh, is is very important. But we we what if we think about what are we asking leaders to do? Right, I think we're asking leaders to say, look, what to what to the workforce. I actually really do care about your safety. And I actually want to make sure that, that, you know, you don't get hurt, you don't become unwell, and I genuinely care. So mm. th there is a balance here in that leaders must understand why they need to get involved and what the implications might be for them. And they're going to be legal and cost-based, mo mostly. But they also need to understand that the message that connects with other people in the company is one about the moral side. For, for example, no no high-level leader is going to go, look, just follow the rules because we're going to get prosecuted if you don't follow the rules. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah that, that, that's not going to work. Uh, well, I, I hope they wouldn't say that. Um, Nobody would care even if they did, would they? Like, no, you don't well, care. Sure. If, you're, if you're on the shop floor, you don't really care if the company gets prosecuted because it's not, well, not going to affect thing. you, really. Correct. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's a waste of time argument. You know, okay, 
maybe longer term it would but yeah not really yeah so yeah. that moral bit you're right you know that moral bit is the connection you know i really care about you i don't want you to get hurt so here's the things we've put in place for you there you go mm -hmm. and, and by the yeah. way please let us know if you think we can improve it you know yeah yeah have you got any examples of um members people in the sector that have done that i mean obviously there's the alcoa you know the famous alcoa example uh from yeah. from uh years and years ago in the states but have you got anything kind of more current where you know just give a flavor for where somebody Oops. as an organization has, has taken that on and, and succeeded with it yeah absolutely so uh, i i i won't say the name of the company mm -hmm. um but th there's two there's two of our uh bigger members uh and uh, for obvious reasons, I can't say the name of the company, but they're well yeah, known. Yeah. You know, everyone listening and watching would know the companies, right? So they're very large, and I have to be careful I don't describe them too uh, well yeah, here. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but they're big. You know, they're global. And one of them has, has has come to us and said, "Well, and it's just the conversation you or I are having today, really. You know, we're, we're pretty good at safety. We've got all these rules and regulations, um, and everyone's you know pretty much follows the rules, wears the right PPE, etc." But we're still having X number of um, accidents a year, you know, and, and we haven't had any fatalities, but we're having a large number of accidents. And also there's this ill health issue, right? You know, people are off work for various um, health, you know, work related reasons. So I said, we're pretty good at process, but how do we really get into the, how do we continue that, that downward trend? And the, the answer really is, is about what we've been talking about. So, so what we designed with the company, and this is a sort of, this is our, what's the word, um, our sort of sweet spot or USP. This is what we yep. do. We, we we don't just go in and say, okay, you know, you can have a, a three-day IOSH course, pick the box, that'll, you know, that'll do everything you want it to do. Yeah. We, we design um, our courses, and they may or may not be accredited by IOSH or NEBOSH, whoever, that, you know, yep. fine. But we design them with the company. So if we're going to talk about, behavior and culture we're going to talk about the company example i know that sounds very simplistic but we want case studies from the organization so with this in this case there was a, a few case studies where you know behavior had played, played a huge part in the accident so we put those forward um we got and, and the company we worked with that i'm thinking of in, in this example here were fantastic i mean they said help us you know we'll do anything you want us to do within reason just what, what do you need right so so the yep. ceo the ceo the most senior person at this large global organization um came to the pilot courses that we ran so we ran half day courses to start with for uh management level and, and now we're sort of taking that down to the next level of, of people so by management i mean sort of supervisor level yep. and and this ceo came in and opened the course you know, and, and said, look, this is why this is important to me. I, I actually do, I, these weren't the actual words, I actually do care, I want things to mm. to, yeah. to get better. We do all, all these good things for you, but we're still having problems, you know, mm. and this is why we're doing this. And and he actually came and did that in person. Now, you know, practicality-wise, that's not possible with every course. It's a very large organisation, clearly. But what he's, what he's done is he's done the pilot version of that, and then he's recorded a video yeah, that we play now at the beginning of every um, every course that we run. So, so you know, we've we've developed this very very bespoke course, and I think the important thing there is okay, you know, explain what behaviour is about, explain what culture is, explain why people make the wrong decision. We're all human, fine, you know, yes, agreed. Explain why that happens, but then importantly, that's all very interesting. But to the audience on the course. What do you want us to do then? You know, what, mm. what's the action? What's what we do? So what's been important with this company is we've we've launched the training, we've delivered the training, but we've had a tangible thing at the end where we can say, right, this is what we want you to do now. So we've got this new, for example, new near miss um, system that's very easy and isn't an eight page document. So can you now get involved in that? Now you know how important that is. And also change the organization a bit so it's just easier for people to communicate problems and it's and it's really i, I tell you what it's, it's really interesting when you talk to supervisors and you say you know health and safety actually is a priority and they might say if they're being honest they might say well yeah i know that it says that on all the posters and so on but mm -hmm. actually you know it isn't really 
And, and part of the argument, honestly, is no, it, no, it is. That's why we're here. That's why the company have paid for us to come and do this training. And that's why the CEO is here, either in person or video, you know, explaining that that is the case. So it's a misperception at that middle level sometimes. Mm. So, so that's what we've done. And really, a couple of really important stats on this. So we've been running this program for a year now. Mm -hmm. In the first six months of delivery, um, eighty-five percent of the our target audience had been trained. So, in in six months, we've trained all supervisors at this company. So that that's mm -hmm. a measure of the company's or uh, a result of the company's interest and involvement, but also, I guess, our um, ability to deliver multiple training courses on the same day or whatever it might be. You know, but. Yep. That, that's had a huge impact. The other impact is that they have seen near misses go up by about 50%. You know, and, and interestingly with that, and, you know, and I've had this conversation lots and lots of times with senior people in organisations, it's quite scary because we've done this, yes. you know, we, we do, and then we've, near misses have gone up. I mean, what's going on? It's completely not what we wanted. Yeah. Well, no, near misses haven't gone up. They haven't gone up, no. Just right. they're being recorded for once, yeah. Exactly, yeah, and they weren't before. So, mm. and, and because they're recorded, now you can do something about it. So, yeah. So that's that's where we've had a real uh, impact. Um, mm. We've we've got a we've got a four stage model. I, I won't go through it here. I can, um, you know, we, we we can talk about references at the end. Um, so I can. See yeah, we can pop a link into that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but we've got a four stage model that um, takes people through this journey, and and you know. Pillar number one, leadership commitment. That's everything we've been talking about today, really. So, yeah, that that's a sort of that's a success story, mm. um, and and lots of other organisations are starting to talk to us. And quite often, it comes out of you know you are doing this, you know, three day course for us, you know, and and, and it's been done. And and those twelve people are, are now to do a risk assessment and all the other bits and pieces, which is really valuable. But how do we take the next step? And that's where yeah. we start having this conversation. Yeah, yeah, great. Glad, glad to hear some some good um, good examples of, of progress. Uh, yeah. A couple more couple more questions for you, Chris, before sure. we wrap it up. Okay. Um, in, interested to sort of hear about any um, emerging trends or technology that are particularly exciting for you in terms of you know that, that could affect the sector. I'm, I'm thinking, I suppose, about you know robotics and AI in particular, which. Okay for me but what, what are you sort of excited about okay so so that again you know once again a really interesting question genuinely because we are we're really excited about uh, a new um ai partnership which we're going to announce uh, shortly so i won't say too much about it now but we, we're going to announce it in, in the next couple of weeks um and the, the business that we're partnering with uses AI as a risk control, as a solution. So I think a lot of the time, a lot of the documents and papers and things I read is looking at AI from a risk point of view. You know, it's a, it's a dangerous and uh, we've got to control the risks and it's a new uh, hazard that we're bringing into the workplace. We need to work on that. And, and that's all true. But the angle that we're coming from is that actually AI, if you really understand it and use it properly, can be a, a huge risk control tool. Mm -hmm. So... So what we are, um, what what we'll be doing in the next few weeks is, is as I say, launching this partnership. It's with an organisation that uses AI to, and this sounds a bit science fiction, I think, but it's, it, you know, it isn't, um, uses AI and camera technology to analyse what people are doing. So yeah. from, a, from an ergonomic point of view, you know, they can um, capture someone or film someone doing a some sort of manual, I don't know, if you think about a production line type task, and they track that they they know what good ergonomic uh, um, positioning is, yep. and it tracks when it isn't. So it, does, it just runs in the background automatically, and it highlights where there are activities that are that, that present a risk. So activities that are making people perform in, in a, not the um, optimum ergonomic way and therefore then we can do something about that and the yeah. system captures all the data and so on mm -hmm. but you know what, what uh, you know what's really good about that though is the next stage so this service this product this tool 
also looks at behaviors mm. which sounds a bit you know how, how does that happen but it looks at things like ppe compliance are people wearing the right thing you know running where they shouldn't be not staying on the gangway um getting too close to restricted areas to vehicles yeah. and the, the 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 tool actually allows manufacturers businesses companies people that buy it to make their own rules so mm -hmm. you know i've i've used it so it, we know that it's really easy to use you know you you can make rules up to say if a person goes close to this thing for this amount of time then capture that raise an alert etc and, and so the company can do what they like on, on that um yes. Yeah, so it's good. Yeah, and, and then you mm. you you do that. You collect the data. Most importantly, you do something about it. You know that yeah. that's that's the issue. Going yeah. back to what we were saying before, yeah. um, and and I think just to wrap it all together, I, I think it's one of the barriers which I am thinking and it's obvious that will happen is there will be this suspicion of you know why is the camp why is the AI filming me and you know yeah, yeah. et cetera et cetera, and so there's a couple of things on that. Number one, it, it it doesn't look at the individual. You can set it to obscure faces, and so you can't see who it is. It's about the operation, not the person. And secondly, it's about the culture of the business. You know that that tool, that service, that you know thing, uh, AI, isn't going to work in a company where the culture is not very good and the workers are very mm -hmm. suspicious of management. It's not going to yeah. happen. Uh, so. The, the two things have got to go together so so that's yeah. that's what i see coming along very soon it's here, it's here now um yeah. certainly something that make uk are going to get more involved in uh in in the next you know few weeks nice, nice. Yeah. okay great uh, last question um we we've spoken obviously about areas to improve uh in, in yeah. the manufacturing world uh safety but what if somebody was joining us that isn't in manufacturing what lessons could maybe two or three points could you um, sort of share with them on what they could learn from manufacturing that they could apply to their business that would potentially be beneficial? Sure. So, so I've, I, I've, as you say there, we've talked about a lot of things that manufacturing can do better, but something that manufacturing is really, really good at for lots of obvious reasons is, is being process driven, you know? So yeah. this is the five step process I go through to make this. Okay, you know, I'm oversimplifying it, but but everyone gets the point, I'm sure. Yep. So because there's a clear process, it is, let's say, easier to put health and safety controls in place. So it is easier to do that. Mm. Um, so if you're in an, an organisation that's not manufacturing and you're struggling with, you know, health and safety and how do we implement it, I think that the being clear about your processes, you know, removing all this confusion about, well, sometimes it happens this way, sometimes it's that way. Let's start at the beginning. This isn't health and safety. This is just no. you know, yeah. business, right? You know, what's the clear process? How do we do? How do we get from A to B and, and so on? Once you've got that, then you can start to wrap health and safety and, and, and well-being and all those other uh, pieces around it. Um, mm. So that that's why... I'm not saying, just let, let me be really clear here. I'm not saying health and safety is easy in manufacturing. We all know no, it no. isn't. But it really does help that we are a process-driven um, sector. And so mm. other business, other sectors that aren't can, I think, you know, look at that, learn from that, uh, and, and put other things in place. And I think the other thing, and, and I've talked about it already, is manufacturing over the years for, for lots of reasons. One, because it's a highly regulated industry. Two, because it's a high risk industry in a lot of places. I've really got serious about how do we get down from this 138 to the next, you know, fatalities? How do we get it to zero or, or whatever the target might be? And they've really realized that culture, leadership, behavior is important. And so I don't know if every sector knows that. Um, yeah. I think that's really important. And, you know, that leaders know the influence they have they know the power they have um and um they use it for the right reasons you know yeah. they, they can use it to influence the right behaviors so yeah. th those are a couple of things where i think that we, we're doing the first one we do well in manufacturing the second one we're getting better at both of them can be extended yeah. into different sectors perfect perfect great stuff chris thank you very much
Um, so uh, let's round it up then. Um, where can people learn more? Um, have you got anything you want to plug or anything you want to share? Resources, websites, yeah. webinars, anything. The floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we, we could be here all day, Christian. But so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. But two, two things. So so our our website is uh, pretty straightforward. It's, it's Although I've got it up here, so I don't get it wrong. Uh, www.makeuk.org. So if you go onto that um, website or just type Make UK into to any search engine, you'll come up um, to our to our web page. Now, as I talked about before, Make UK is a very diverse organisation. So when you come onto our website, you'll you'll be faced with um, it may not be health and safety related. It might be some lobbying yeah. doing with the government on something. Um, you know that that's because we're such a diverse organisation. So so once you're on there various tabs along the top if you go onto services and then health safety and sustainability that that's where you go and yeah. there's there's some really really helpful stuff in there uh, it breaks it down into training consultancy uh, membership software that i've talked about and we are really interested in not just giving training courses you know doing training courses giving out certificates we want to support people through that journey of professional development and of yeah. helping your company to be safer. So there's a lot on our website that explains that, explains how the new IOSH um, membership process works and all that sort of stuff. So that's useful. Yeah. Um, if people want a shorter uh, snippet of, of what we're doing, we have a uh, podcast nowadays. So it's called the Root Course Analysis Podcast. So hopefully quite easy to remember. Yeah. Um, and we've got, I think we've just done our fifth episode, fifth or sixth and, and we talked to, just, just to give you a flavour, in, in the first one, we talked to the chief inspector from the HSE. Mm -hmm. um, and in the last one, we've talked, we've spoken to a very, very senior sustainability director of a, of a global organisation. So just really useful and interesting. And along that, we're talking to one of our own members of staff that's going through the IOSH uh, membership nice. journey at the minute. So, you know, whatever people need, if they'd, they'd rather yeah. look at the website, it's all there you know the, the the podcast root cause analysis it's on spotify it's on youtube um hopefully people find it interesting yeah and um un unlike uh other podcast hosts i won't cut that bit out about another <laughs> podcast <laughs> <laughs> obviously yeah yeah no um, I'm, I'm, i i i love podcasts so um that's why yeah. i've got my podcast because i love podcasts and i, I yeah why same. I, yeah let's get involved so uh yeah yeah same. No, and, and, and podcasts um, are a good thing and we, we've got to have you on our podcast uh, as well. Uh, uh, very happy, sometime. very happy to come on. We'll we'll arrange yeah. that sometime soon. Yeah, no, no problem whatsoever. Definitely. Good stuff. All right, Chris. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, I think we covered some really interesting and useful ground there. So whether you're in manufacturing or not, I'm sure there's some great nuggets to to take from this. So uh, trust you enjoyed it. Um, thank yeah. you very much, Chris, for joining. Well, thank um, you, Christian. I, I definitely yeah. did enjoy it, and as you say, hopefully it's been useful. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. And thanks for joining Chris and I today. We'll see you again on next week's podcast episode. Cheers. Thanks for joining us on the Safety and Risk Success podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit follow and do share on social media. Does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest, even yourself? If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.